So now I'd like to introduce Dr. Turner Slyko. Dr. Slyko will be hosting an add-on session again tomorrow uh, to further discuss this topic of osteopathy and the human experience. Dr. Slyko has his own private practice in Portland, Oregon, and he completed his medical degree at the Texas College of Osteopathic Medicine and is board certified in neuromuscular medicine, osteopathic manipulative care. So I talked to him this morning a little bit of, about his practice and he's fully devoted to the, this type of care and uh, enjoys it a lot. So I know that anybody that works in what they enjoy usually can relate that well. So we look forward to this Thank lecture. You. Thank you. Yeah. Hope everyone's doing all right. I drew the coveted uh, after lunch day two slot. So I'm gonna try <laughs> not to away. put you uh, into snooze zone. Um, but it said osteopathy and the human experience. I kind of caveated and just sort of changed that a little bit to osteopathy and pain. And so the pain experience is still the human experience. And it's one of those things that, you know, we treat a lot of different things in acute medicine and things like that, but the experience of pain and ultimately how your physiology is responding and what it's doing with everything else, this could be applied to non-pain conditions, your experience and understanding of your diabetes or your high blood pressure, whatever else like that, that fine body connection will influence how physiology is um, responding and behaving and everything, but we're gonna kind of focus more specifically uh, on specifically with pain. So here's some learning objectives, uh, define pain and how the body perceives and processes pain uh, and discuss how osteopathy can influence the, the body to better handle this process. Uh, we're gonna do some review on fascia and uh, review some research on OMT and pain conditions. So uh, pain by definition, uh, physical feeling caused by disease, injury, or something that hurts the body. Uh, pain can also be mental or emotional suffering, sadness caused by someone or some emotional or mental problem, and then someone or something that causes trouble or makes you feel annoyed or angry, or some uh, definitions from Miriam Webster for pain. So you can see pain, even though we discuss pain and it's an internal experience, is also a very physical response to pain. Emotion and how the body displays pain, uh, there's a wonderful uh, cognitive neuroscientist named Antonio Damasio, and he's written a handful of books about the emotional, like how human consciousness is constructed and really talks about how emotion is rooted in the word motion. It's a physical response to an environmental cue. So people process pain lots of different ways, expletives, wincing, things like that. You can also have the perception that you're getting stronger from pain, um, pain, weakness, leaving the body and you working out and getting this pain sensation. And some people thrive on that response to get going a uh, little word diagram, giving some different things when you talk about pain and what people associate with pain. So it's really not a universal experience that everyone has. And so osteopathy can come in and try and again, help that person through their perception uh, for the pain process. Uh, this is a little review of the pain pathway. Here you see on the top one, the site of injury at number one, and then you've got that um, nociceptive signal up to the brain, then going in through all the pathways. I'm not gonna overdo the neuroanatomy again, because I'm in the one o'clock postprandial lunch slot, but you can see that pathway as it goes up and comes back down. You have lots and lots and lots of brain centers that activate when you have pain. It is a brain-wide phenomenon that experiences pain. It activates the limbic system, the thalamus. You get the primary and sensory, uh, secondary sensory, uh, primary and secondary somatosensory cortex. You activate the anterior cingulate cortex, the prefrontal cortex, the insula. And you can see on these slides here some of the different things that are regulated by these different, uh, these different centers of the brain. You also get the amygdala involved, cerebellum involved. Um, and so there's just the entire brain lights up and it doesn't light up the same way in every person, depending on previous experience and how the body has learned to get used to and deal with experience from pain in the past. Um, you've got like, a, again, your somatosensory cortices and insula, that's where encoding the sensory features of pain, the quality, the location, the duration, uh, the prefrontal and limbic systems encode the emotional and motivational responses. Um, these regions are not just activated by nociceptin. Also, you can have other regions activated by pain and where pain is a learned state in the brain and you can have chronic pain state as a learned state. Um, 
So basically, if one has no brain, one has no pain. So I've had a lot of people over the years get referred to neurologists in particular, and if there anyone in here who is a neurologist, I'm not, not, but it's like when the headache can't be figured out, they get the pain processing, pain's all in your head, and the patient thinks that they're being told that they're politely crazy. But again, it is, it's really, without that brain processing and integrating all of that information coming up, you wouldn't really experience pain. Uh, in addition to that pain sensation, you also have that inhibitory descending pain pathway that goes from your periaqueductal gray activation. Uh, and it is something that can be trained in people to activate, to inhibit. You can see that pain gate in the circle right there um, that's coming back down. You can get very, very profound analgesia by stimulating the periaqueductal peri gray. And some mindfulness practice and things like that can work towards activating and turning that down. Um, there's lots of examples of it. There's um, a gentleman, I don't know if anybody goes looking on the internet, there's a guy from uh, Holland named Wim Hof who does a lot of breathing meditation. I do his breathing meditation every day. The man can sit in a, in a tub of ice to here for two hours with no change in his core body temperature. He doesn't process pain as a nociceptive thing or cold as a nociceptive thing because he's trained his body physically to not care about the pain. If you get it to where you don't care, that's in, like, again, I told you that it's a, a body motion thing. Your autonomic nervous system is not going to have that fight or flight reaction to that stimulus. It doesn't have to be cold. It could be anything you're thinking of. When your autonomic nervous system doesn't respond and go hypersympathetic, then you don't have changes. Your vascular tone is different if you are in fight or flight, if you're not in fight or flight. That affects the way organs are perfused, fascia is perfused, all those different things. So that physiologic response to pain is an important thing in mindfulness and working with some of that perception of it with patients can be another way that you can work where you're not necessarily doing manipulation in the traditional sense of osteopathy, but working with the person on how they process this and how their body is going through it and whatnot. So here's a really, really wonderful diagram of the different area coming from say like a knee and where you're seeing the nociception and then back up into the brain. I like this because you can see the different entry points for the different uh, pharmacologic indicator. Uh, interactions we can have. Um, in particular, where you see the two opioids and periaqueal ductal gray and the rostral ventral medial um, nucleus there where the opioids come in. Again, trying to get that, that stimulation of that descending pain regulation to turn most of this off and block it further down the line. Again, can be done with drugs, but we can also get it with some other stuff. So pain is a really complex multidimensional process. Um, the human health machine is vibrant and resilient. I have seen so many things that people have been plagued with for years that if you can get the body back in line with itself, they'll process it through when they'll come through it and go out and not have pain because we just have a really resilient uh, body that we can work with. Um, and the osteopathy is focused to optimize physiologic function given the patient's condition. You're trying to bring them back to a better healthy midpoint uh, so that they're better processing that. I think traditionally, a lot of times nowadays, we tend to think of OMM in the sort of orthopedic adjunct kind of thing. It's like, oh, I have a rotator cuff tear. Oh, I've got osteoarthritis in my fill in the blank where it doesn't matter. But it's really in addition to getting positional misdiagnosis and somatic dysfunction out of things, you're trying to optimize physiologic function of the tissue so that every that the entire system will perform better. If you have something like knee pain or pneumonia, or any other thing. It's really like your lungs are not sitting in the hospital having pneumonia while the rest of your body is out at Starbucks getting a coffee. You as a human being have pneumonia. And so the human being has pain and the human being's function has to be, it, the better you optimize it, the better it works. So um, Urban Core, if anybody doesn't know that name or doesn't remember that name, was a physiologist that came into osteopathy, I think back in the 70s or the 80s with the goal of disproving osteopathy and saying that it didn't work. Uh, he worked at Kirksville. My mentor from school worked with him for quite a while. 
And after two years of research, he then flipped and devoted his entire career to showing how this does work. And he really had a wonderful summation that you see in this quote here, that every time you correct somatic dysfunction, you return to the autonomic nervous system, the ability to make appropriate moment to moment decisions. If you're stuck in these loops where your body has had a reaction and it's remembered in the tissue and remembered in the body, you're still not going to adapt to all the umpteen billion decisions it makes in a lifetime. And so by taking out that tissue, I'll call it interference, you're better able to regulate everything um, and do better with everything. So by normalizing that structure function relationship, you allow the patient to better handle or resolve the problem. Again, optimize structure to optimize function and the person will generally do better. So outside of all of that, obviously, if they have a really rotated thorax or their pelvis isn't moving or whatever else like that, they're just not gonna have good mobility. Um, a lot of the things nowadays with everything in the opioid crisis and everything else like that, we can't just keep shoveling pain medication to people. We have to get them functioning better. There's a lot of times when people have had a problem and it just needs to be taken out of the system so they can physically function better. Um, really helpful. Like we tend to punt people down into physical therapists and they do a lot of work, but sometimes there's still an inherent problem that needs to be treated out of the person before the physical therapy will be responsive so that they get the, uh, the improvement that they need out of it. And again, it facilitates healing process for damaged tissue, which I'll talk about a little bit more in just a second. Um, again, you want to look at the patient as an entire organism, hence A.T. Still's idea, treat the body, not the problem. It's like, I need this physiology, this whole system to be better. Um, if a local anatomical cause cannot be determined, one must look outside the area. You have compensation mechanisms in your body that affect the way the rest of the system works. And so you could have an injury somewhere else that wasn't able to heal because you've done something somewhere else that the body still hasn't negotiated that if we get that out of the way, it allows that physiologic response to turn back and get through that, um, that tissue problem. So again, treat the patient, not just the problem, which if anybody, if anybody who went to osteopathic medical school has probably heard that a few times. So I'm gonna talk a little bit now about fascia. Um, part of it is because it is such a ubiquitous thing in the body and something that we can have, it has a colossal influence on so many different things. A few years ago, I think it was 2017 pre-pandemic, there was an article in the news that the interstitium had been discovered and that science figured out that here we have all this space in between. And the, the guy in the article is like, well, once you see it, you can't unsee it. I was like, we've been doing this since 1892. Thanks for finally recognizing us in 2019 or whatever else it was. And so this is really a structure that touches everything. And one of the things to consider is like it, it in all of that fascial network that you're having, you have a lot of fluid moving through all of that fascia. Um, all of the white lines in there that you see in this one, and I should show you a couple of examples of fascia, it touches every single cell everywhere, period. Um, it's very intricate. There's tons of layers, there's tons of dynamic stuff that goes on in the fascia that we don't really appreciate. This is a pictures of some living, actual done with a laparoscope pictures that two uh, French uh, osteopaths or uh, scientists went through and looked at. We don't appreciate this in medical school when we dissect cadavers because it's dehydrated and it's dead and it's not dynamic and living. It's very active. It's very responsive to mechanical transduction. There's a ton of fluid moving through it. Um, I'm happy to leave with somebody the, the book that this came out of. They have videos of these guys putting this camera under the skin and just pulling tension on skin and watching how that tissue responds. And that tissue responds really, really fast. And it's really interesting to watch how it is. Here's another picture. You can see it where that fascia is going in and investing all the way into the muscle tissue. And it is literally just everywhere you peel apart. I remember being in general gross anatomy and it's like, well, we just got to cut all that away so we can see the sphincter of Odie or we can see the gallbladder or whatever else like that. So we just kind of gloss over it and don't see it. And it's hard to see because it's everywhere. Another example, this is an endothelial, or the uh, endothelial cells of a lymphatic vessel. You can see every single one of those lymphatic vessels has a little piece of collagen fiber attached to it, which is part again of your fascia touching every single cell. And so fascia, an uninterrupted viscoelastic tissue which forms a functional three-dimensional collagen matrix. It penetrates all structures of the body from head to toe. It's a functional organ of stability and motion, and it is very much not a passive structure. 
Uh, structure of fascia, you've got collagen, uh, resistance, provides resistance and tension to, uh, and to tension and stretch. It's 28 different types of collagen in human fascia and multiple combinations of, of, of collagen. On that collagen, you then have a lot of proteoglycans, which are the major component of animal extracellular matrix, uh, involved in binding cations as well as water. Uh, it can regulate movement of molecules through the matrix and then also serve as a lubricant to the tissue. Then also in there, you've got the wonderful fibroblasts that are involved in wound healing and repairing this structure that we drive around all day long. Um, some of the, glyc some of the, the glycosaminoglycans, and you can kind of take a look at that. I'm not gonna read the whole thing. All of these different things in helping provide structural support, um, holding on water. The gags have a lot of polarizing to hold water on this fascial structure. Um, and so I really, really like this diagram here because you see the collagen fibers in yellow, and then you see all of those different fibers that are hanging off of that collagen matrix. And then you see the cell that's going on and attaching onto that. And then not in this, but then you've got that whole microtubule microfilament network inside the cell. And so this is really all connected to itself so that basically fascia is the sponge that brings that into the body that we can, we are still a watery thing from the moment we're born to the moment that we die. Um, water, as you guys know, does a lot of different things in the body. Um, all those different functions there, lubrication, flushes waste, regulates body temperature. Um, it also helps in that sponge water analogy that we are perpetually regrowing the thing that we're driving with our mental self. There's not many cell types in the body that don't repopulate over time. So we are essentially a sponge filled with water growing a garden of human being cells. And that's where you get into some of the things AT still said in the past about irrigate the withering fields because they won't grow properly because they're not getting hydrated and nutrition in and out of the, in and out of the cell system. So we are perpetually regrowing. Um, I mean, again, you know, like we think of the skeleton being the skeletons replaced every 10 years. I mean, you regrow most things. You don't regrow things like uh, lens cells uh, in the cornea. You don't regrow nerves in the central nervous system. The heart, uh, heart muscles also stop growing. And if you think about some of the deficits when we get things like strokes, and it's such a detrimental injury to the patient is because we can't regenerate that back up, but a lot of other things we can regenerate. And again, all of that tissue functioning better by allowing better representation of one structure to another and making sure that tissue is healthy and flushing fluid the right way is in paramount to proper physiologic performance of your patient. A fetus when they're born is approximately 94% water. By the time you're old and gray, you're 50% water. So you're still more water and empty space than anything else in the body. And it's important that that water keeps moving through. If anyone here in Oklahoma has a swimming pool, I live in Oregon and it's not worth it. If your pool filter is dirty, that pool turns green because it's not circulating fluid properly through oil filter in the car the same way. That same thing goes with fascial tissue as well. Um, this was uh, just some statistics by body tissue from a guy who dissected and weighed out all the organs in 1945 of an average 35 year old male that you can see even the skeleton is 31% water. Um, everything else otherwise is 60% or better water. And so water is really, really important, which we all know. Uh, plasma, 92% water. Um, it constitutes 55% of your blood volume. Um, obviously we need to stay hydrated. People feel thirsty when they've lost two to 3% of their body water, but their mental and physical performance is impaired at 1% of body water loss. And so it's important to keep the body hydrated. You can drink 12 gallons of water in one day if your fascia is restricted and you have impeded fluid motion through that fascia, you're not going to hydrate the cells growing off that sponge as well as they would if they were properly hydrated and it's just gonna change function. So again, that's what part of what we're looking for. Osteopathic manipulation, in addition to correcting rotation and side bending and flexion and extension and et cetera, et cetera, is also the goal about to restore unobstructed fluid exchange in the tissue. So that comes back through and flushes that that's what we're trying to do. Obviously then you have to have the person stay hydrated. Just more evidence with this, why a plant-based diet can be beneficial to people because you need water in the frame. 
common dehydrators, I'm sure you guys know a lot about these, alcohol, high salt contate, caffeine at higher doses, coffee is protective against your liver for alcohol damage. So the more coffee you drink, the better it is. So don't stop drinking your coffee, but just know when I think it's 200 milligrams of, of caffeine is when you start to get dehydrated. I may be wrong. Somebody knows the answer. You can correct me. But the other one in particular there, because my son is always asking me, dad, can I get a Gatorade? Dad, can I get a Gatorade? Is high sugar drinks. Um, Gatorade in a 32, I might have this a little bit further down. Um, Gatorade in a 32 ounce container has 14 teaspoons of sugar in it. There's 14 sugar cubes in one 32 ounce bottle of Gatorade. It's really Kool-Aid with a little bit of electrolytes in it. So I, he can drink Pedialyte, he can't drink Gatorade, he's always angling for the Gatorade. But people go, Monster Energy, all those different things. A lot of the sugar stuff, I heard on the radio last week in Oregon that they're now making apple pie Pepsi and a couple of other flavors of Pepsi that they found a way to put more sugar in Pepsi and people just keep drinking it and you get dehydrated. Your body's just not going to function properly. So going back to the pain conversation, those signals going in and through all those nerves, which are also made of water and fluid and everything like that, you're just going to get distortion of pain signal and it's going to make it not, you can't adapt and, and, and process it the same way as if you were uh, properly hydrated and moving properly. So fascia, um, fiber orientation is really, really important when it comes to fascia. Um, your fibers are oriented parallel to predicted force vectors. Um, you essentially wrinkle your body in the way that you use it all the time. I think it's some of the reason why the weekend warrior who goes out and cleans up all the yard and then wakes up on Monday and they're destroyed. Where it's like, I didn't seem like I did that much. I raked some leaves. I shoveled some stuff. I did this. I went home da, 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 out in the heat, a little bit dehydrated, whatever. You're working against those patterns that are in the body and those patterns develop more quickly than I think we give them credit for. And so your average U.S. citizen is very used to being bent at the knees, bent at the hips, hips forward, if you think of computer posture. And when you're doing things like, I'm going to shovel this this way, your body's like, no, 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 I do this. I know this very well. And you're working against those wrinkles. So over time, as we age, we tend to get more one dimensional. Like I watch my son, he asked me during the pandemic, we out of the, by my, the school by my house. Hey, dad, you want to run around and play freeze tag for a while? I'm like, I am 40 years old, like 40 year old and freeze tag doesn't go together. And he's just all over the place. And we're very dynamic in that spot. But at the same time, he is a lot more aqueous and rubbery than I am. And so we tend to get into that sort of comfort zone behavior and do these certain things. And then when you step out of them for that rare experience, it can really mess with someone else like that. So that's where things like Dance, yoga, Pilates, rock climbing, all these multi-dimensional movements that we're not used to doing in the majority of our weekday allows that fascia to respect and understand that I need to be able to do those things also and not be stuck in this program of I'm stuck in a seated position. So that's some of that other benefit that comes in addition to strength and meditative um, approach and everything else like that. So. The other thing interesting with mechanotransduction is that it does change cell function. You can influence the genome faster with touch than you can with drugs. It will transmit that force and activate the ability for the nucleus and the, and the DNA to unwind. I remember reading an article when I was a resident about how the cranial rhythmic impulse affects DNA replication because that fluctuation of fluid through the system affects the way that the, the DNA will zip and unzip. And so it can cause problems at a genomic level. Um, the other interesting thing, there was a big research, or not a big research article, but there was some research done on fibroblasts in fascia and that when they are morphologically distorted, they do not display their genome the same way as if they're not distorted. And so when you have this fascial network that's all bound to itself and it gets hung up on itself in the wrong way, those fibroblasts can't fix it unless we get the fascia unbound to repair. The goal is to get it to repair. And that, I mean, it's, it was very noticeable in, this, in, this, in, the, in the study that was done. So um, your fascia is also very, very innervated. Uh, there's free encapsulated and non-encapsulated nerve endings. You have proprioception, vibration and pressure, stretch, heat. There's a lot of stuff. And so your fascia senses along with your brain. So 
I'm going to do a little uh, kind of making sure not so far nobody's asleep yet. So it's pretty good. So I'm just going to do a palpation exercise. I can't really do a lot of OMT in a lecture hall like this, but I'd like you guys, if you can take an object that you have, a cell phone, pick something that's got a decent amount of size to it, a bag of snacks or whatever else like that. And I just want you to pick up whatever you're picking up. The cup of coffee is fine, whatever. And just get a sense of what that feels like in your hand, the texture, the consistency, the surface contact of your hand. Like we're just going to use our hands and take them in and just get a sense while I'm talking about what that feels like to you. And I know probably not everybody does as much OMT per week as I do, but you can still appreciate this. So once you have that, now I want you to add the palpatory sense. I want you to sort of think about it. It's like, even though you're touching that piece of whatever you have in your hand, your brain is what's helping you sense that. So try and get a sense of like holding that there to invoke your entire, uh, my entire arm and all of this connective tissue is helping me understand what's holding me in what's holding in my hand. And you're feeling the object with your whole extremity, not just your fingertips. You should appreciate that there is more, a, a deeper sense of what that is. You may get more of the sense of the volume or it feels harder to me, or there's a density to there in it that I didn't appreciate when I was just touching it with my fingers. And so again, you really live in your body tissue interpreted by your brain, but we are very much, and the stuff from Dr. Damasio really talks about the conscious existence of a human being is constructed in your body. We don't live in a little projector house up here. We live in here. This helps us interpret it. And a lot of somato-emotional trauma and trauma, if you talk to like clinical psychologists, trauma is a body phenomenon. It's not a brain phenomenon. It's how the brain is interpreting it that causes a lot of that emotional component. He would say that emotion is the physical display. A feeling is the internal processing of that emotional response to things. And it's just, we have a lot of emotion or motion response to external trigger. So research. Recovery from chronic low back pain after OMT. Uh, this study looked at 345 patients, 271 of them attended all the sessions, basically non-specific low back pain. Six OMT sessions over eight weeks, recovery assessed at 12 weeks. The OMT regimen was associated with significantly and clinically relevant measures for recovery from low back pain. Uh, patients without depression were more likely to recover from chronic low back pain with OMT. Again, your mind-body connection, your mind and your mental understanding of what's going on will change the way your physiology responds to things. And so the depression thing goes in with that as well. Uh, I put this in here. I read this a couple of years back about acetaminophen in pregnancy, which is generally considered safe. Uh, they looked at almost 8,000 mothers and examined the behavior of the children after they were born. At, if they were using Tylenol at 18 weeks of pregnancy, they were 42% more likely to report hyperactivity in the child and 31% more likely to report conduct problems in the child. And if they saw the, the stuff, uh, the use more at 32 weeks, they 29% of the more em emotional difficulties in their children at age seven. So there are implications in, as you guys all know, giving drugs and there's always, there's something that goes on and I'm not a teetotaler. I think that pharmacology is fantastic. I think that there's plenty of great chemistry but it's just not the answer for everything. So there was a study done um, that looked at pregnancy and manipulation. And the object was to study OMT to treat back pain and related symptoms during the third trimester, the, that last 10 weeks that separates, that really makes the mom the mom. Control OMT and sham ultrasound was done. Control was basically standard obstetric care. The OMT group was obstetric care and OMT and the sham ultrasound was sham ultrasound and standard care seven visits, 30 minute treatments. The treatment protocol was soft tissue, myofascial release, muscle energy and range of motion mo mobilizations. That's anything that anybody after two years of osteopathic medical school, even mediocre hands can execute on a pregnant person. Uh, what they found was, is that the functional deterioration of low back pain in the third trimester was significantly less in the OMT group. The low back pain stayed improved in the OMT group as well. It stayed the same in the sham ultrasound and standard obstetric care made it worse because they weren't really addressing it. Again, if you have back pain and you're pregnant and you go to the doctor and they tell you, like, well, there's nothing I can really do for that. In a way, from an emotional standpoint, the patient might feel abandoned from that. Like, what else can I do? He just told me I just have to live it up. I remember Dr. Chapman. You remember Dr. Chapman from TCOM? He was just like, I mean, I remember a woman. He's 
you ever feel like you're walking around with a giant watermelon in your crotch? And she goes, yeah, he goes, well, that's because you are. It'll be over in 40 weeks. And he walked out the door and she's just like, well, what am I supposed to do with that? You're not getting that addressed. And so then off you go and you leave and you're just not addressed. That changes your approach and your understanding of what's going on. And you might have some baseline anxiety that comes up from that because it's not been addressed with you. So it's really important perception and on people understanding better perception of that kind of stuff. So um, here's another one that looked at uh, physiotherapist assessing uh, use of manual technique for the neck and tension type of headache. Four groups, basically a suboccipital inhibition, like an OA decompression, if you remember that from school. Um, the other one was an, uh, an OAAA articulation, a little bit of compression, uh, circumduction on the vertical axis, kind of stuff that we're doing downstairs. The third one was combined, both of those, and the other one was a placebo. There was basically no treatment, and they rested in the supine position. So they looked at them. What I will say with that, um, is when you don't do anything in a study, you've unblinded that person. If they just go in there and lay down, they know nothing's happening to them. My master's thesis is all in placebos and re researching that against manipulation. If the person's not convinced that you went in there and did something, they know you didn't do something. So they can arguably make their pain. It's like, well, now I, I'm, I'm subconsciously in my treatment group or my sham group, what am I? When you know you weren't treated, you can report it worse. So you can see an artificial effect of it's like this got worse because I know nothing happened to me against the people that do. So convincing shams, they don't have to be sham motions of manipulation, but you have to convince the person that they've had something addressed in their system, just a caveat. Um, so that may skew it a little bit. Um, the outcomes were based on a headache impact test, a disability inventory, pain intensity, and craniocervical range of motion uh, measurements at baseline and the conclusion of the treatment. What they found was statistically significant results found at the conclusion, all three treatment groups did better versus the placebo. And again, placebo with a grain of salt and the fact that it was only 84 people, but most OMM studies are not gigantic because funding and ability and access and whatever else. Uh, the OAA, that articulatory intervention was as effective as the combined and also more effective than the, the suboccipital inhibition alone. Um, but you can see that we got good change in it. So. There's the other thing with connective tissue and all this processing about biotensegrity. Uh, biotensegrity is basically how the fascia is stretched across and how that tension connects with itself to get our bodies to move and do all the things that we want to do. Um, I will explain this to patients in a way that it's like the fabric of a kite and the sticks of a kite do not make the kite fly. You have to physically stretch the fabric over the kites to get the tensegrity over the frame that then it will catch air and fly. So it's very similar to. Um, to the human body that you have that tensegrity as it's going across and how things are adjusting. That's where you can have something where a manipulator might tell us like, oh, well that hip's causing your headaches. Like, I don't get it. It's just leading into a compensation pattern that may be throwing the neck off and we have to clear that to get this again because that whole fascial network is connected to itself. So it's a really interesting article I found about 42 amateur adult athletes with a clinical diagnosis of TMJ dysfunction. Uh, they looked at it, and I don't remember why they got on this, but there was no previous hamstring injury. This study looked at basically adding uh, hold and release proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation, which is essentially muscle energy, on the hamstrings. And then they did that in comparison to ischemic compression of the masseter muscle. What they found was, is after stretching your hamstrings, you could open your jaw better but actually pushing on the masseter muscle, which has to close your jaw, did not do anything. Like you can release all of this, the more you stretched your hamstrings, the more you opened your jaw. And so that idea that a hitch in your get along down below can affect upstream is very much prevalent. It's a really interesting thing. So if anybody in your practice has TMJ, give them some hamstring stretches, maybe that'll kind of help it out, but it's really interesting. So, um, Mind-body connection, there were 24, is another study, uh, participants randomized, they had six chiropractic manipulation, eight spinal mobilization, and 10 therapeutic touch. They basically have exercise injury protocol to induce low back pain. So they basically just overworked their low back. And then they did F, uh, functional MRI analysis pre and post treatment, which I've never seen an article that did fMRI like this. And so it was interesting to see. Uh, the primary outcome measures were functional connectivity between all of these different brain areas that I told you about at the beginning uh, of the 
of the, of the, of the talk here. Um, secondary measures, immediate changes in pain intensity and pain sensitivity. Um, what they found was that the connections between the posterior cingular cortex and the anterior insular cortex were changed from weak negative to weak positive interactions. And the, uh, peri uh, the left PINS and the left PAG showed overall increase over time. And so remember the insular cortex is where sensation is judged as to its degree and where one imagine is, imagines pain. Um, and so the periaqueductal peri gray is again, that area in the brain that if we stimulate it, we can make pain and we can have that descending modulation that they showed a better increase that they were getting better activation of that to reduce pain. One thing they mentioned in that is IBS patients have abnormal processing of visceral pain related to dysfunctional inhibition of pain within the brain. So there's a whole separate thing on IBS, but we're not gonna talk about that. So they also saw a decreased left somatosensory cortex and right PINS over time, um, which was moderately strong prior to the intervention. So um, they didn't see any changes in remote or local brain, uh, pressure pain sensitivity. Again, it was a pretty small study and significant reduction in exercise induced pain intensity that they did see, but again, there was no control group. So you kind of just have to see, but they're good initial like pilot studies or things like that, that we try to get some representation of that as it goes. So again, no natural history in the group and it was acute and not chronic pain because it was induced and small sample size limitations. So another study that I was like, just like to talk to you about since it's again about how your body is processing thing is this has nothing to do with pain, but it has to do with ADHD. They looked at uh, people with a primary diagnosis in children of ADHD uh, included, they tried to just get it to be just ADHD. At 14 treatment and 14 control group, there was no adverse effects noted. OMT is a very safe thing to do to people. If you're worried about doing OMT, if you decide you wanna delve back in and you haven't, just take HVLA off the table and you can pretty much go hunting around and trying. You may not change it, but you're not typically going to hurt. I have never, ever, 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 ever seen a serious adverse event reported from myofascial release, counter strain, indirect treatment, balanced ligamentous tension, any of them. If you're gonna pop something and cause a problem, it's in the neck and chiropractors do it a lot more than we do it. So they obviously have more incidents to it, but I've popped a lot of necks in Texas and didn't have any problem. But that being said, if you want to explore it there, you can know in confidence, at least I can play around with this and try. So the measured performance on this was called the Biancardi Stropa test, which I don't know if anyone knows about, but in a test an ADHD person, they do something like this. The bells are not normally circled. The idea is to take this picture and they have to find all the bells in all of these diagrams and see where they do it. So they're, they're highlighted for you so you can see them, but you would get the test without it. Obviously somebody with ADHD is gonna have a little bit of a problem with this because it's such a busy, uh, busy diagram. They did six sessions over 10 weeks. The first two were weekly and the last four were bi-weekly. It was completely left to the discretion of the provider. Medications continued if they were present in the groups. They did not change any medications at all. The OMT group positively associated with changes. They could do that test better after you treated their body to perform what we consider to be just generally a mental task. And so again, that mind-body connection is influenced by treating the system. I'm sure there was some cranial treatment involved. They didn't put anything in the study about protocol and what they did. But again, it's the whole person has ADHD, not just your brain. And if you can get the body offloaded with somatic dysfunction, the nervous system will just physically function better as well. So again, techniques to use if you decide to, if you don't do this and you want to get back to it, I would tell you not to pop inflamed processes. It's not generally a good thing to do. I don't think again that popping is bad, but you have to use it in the right place. I use it. I don't use it. I use it less in Oregon than I did in Texas as the things go on. It's not any comment on Oregon versus Texas, but you can pop things. I had a guy in Texas pull the engine block out of a Nissan Sentra by lifting into the Nissan Sentra and pulling it out. I mean, you can sit there and be gentle with that. There was hundreds of pounds of force that he put in his back that had to get popped out of his back. You don't fix everything with a hammer. You don't fix all blood pressure with hydrochlorothiazide. So you adjust to see the goal is to meet the person with what they need in there. And really the goal is what do I need to do to instill a physiologic response in that tissue so that the body performs better? So you're really asking for a physiologic change. You're not really changing the physiology. You're helping them change that physiology. So uh, we are working with the tissue, not on the tissue. 
It's something that, again, if you do do some OMT and you keep that, uh, you keep that in mind, you are asking something of your patient, just like going in and asking for lifestyle changes, or I need you to start exercising, or you need to quit smoking, you're asking your patient to do something different for you. The only difference with OMT and that clinic experience is that I'm asking you to do it with my hand, not my mouth. It's still a physiologic conversation that you're having with the person when you interact with them with OMT. We are not Lego men. We are not just bricks of plastic that are twisted that we untwist and everything's better. Obviously, if you're twisted and distorted from a fall or an injury, we have to get that out, but again, it's bringing health back in that tissue so that tissue will function better. Uh, frequency of treatment, uh, you acute conditions need more immediate follow-up. You don't wanna over-treat tissue. The tissue needs time to respond and do what it, you're asking it to do. So now we've corrected the tissue. We need to give it a chance to heal. In body working in general, there's a lot of people, it's like, well, I, I just wanna keep coming back because you've helped me, because you've helped me. There's a lot of, ex it's an, just another thing on the expectation management with patients that if you explain to them what's happening, you don't sit here and do it. They are supposed to do it for you. You are supposed to get paid for them doing it for themselves. And so you gotta give them a chance. If you can explain that to people, they understand it better. Otherwise, they just wanna keep coming back. Um, chronic conditions, if you work on them, they're chronic, they're old. We don't expect a chronic condition to change in one or two treatments. If you talk to old osteopaths, everybody's got a handful of people that they took one treatment and boom, everything's amazing. That is the exception, not the rule. When AT still had the ASO and he had the infirmary at the ASO, you traveled to Kirksville, Missouri, and you stayed there until you were well, and then you went home. In 1892, it was something like 80% of the country was a rural-based practice. We don't have rural-based practices. We can't plant a field of corn and drive to Tulsa and sit in the parking lot and go see the OMT department every day, but you would be treated daily with OMT and you would go until you were well. So again, it takes, not that you can't get profound change in a couple of treatments, but you managing the expectation that we're going to work with this moving forward and it's going to take some time. The more they're in it, the better it changes. Um, getting the patient involved and invested in their healing process. Sometimes it's just education with the person. Sometimes it's, I need you to do some stretches. Half the time I give people stretches to bend their fascia the other way. I don't really care about the muscles, but it's like, we have to pattern this out. But the better they understand, obviously the better they'll do. It goes across the board with medicine. So injury and manipulation, just to keep this on, this was from May, 2002. They estimate the incidence of serious complications range from one per 2 million to one per 400,000. High, high velocity thrusting techniques were implicated. Again, I've never seen a serious adverse event other than things like soreness or treatment response. I wouldn't really call soreness after treatment a serious adverse event. You get sore when you go to the gym because you're asking your physiology to be different. Me treating you and you getting sore is you just went to the osteopathic gym and we're getting that soreness response. So it is something, if you change an old lesion in the system, the people will get sore and it doesn't take a lot of force to make that happen. I've had numerous people like, wow, I was sore for a week. I didn't think you did that much to me. But the whole system, since it's tied to itself and it's hitched, when it changes and you can take that key lesion out of the system, the whole system will adapt. So you're gonna get sometimes some soreness with it. The other one that happens frequently is people get really tired and zonk out and fall asleep. A lot of healing stuff happens at night, stage four REM sleep. So your body's asking like, hey, I need to power off and go to sleep. So, you know, take the time to go to sleep. So um, here's what you see as the cervical spine injury by practitioner. We had a few osteopaths. You see a lot of chiropractors. Chiropractors do way more manipulation than DOs do. Most of us in this country aren't doing this anymore. Um, so obviously they are going to have more. Um, and then you see some naturopaths, physical therapists. I don't remember who fell under the other category, but it's really not that many anyway. I've only ever met one patient who's had one, pro I've met one patient in all my years of doing this so far that knows someone that was physically injured by, chiro by chiropractic manipulation of the neck. Um, the dreaded vertebral artery dissection, unfortunately, is what happened to that person. I passed away from, from a cervical manipulation in an office. Um, so again, slide that off your treatment table and you can do other things and work pretty well with stuff. So um, another look at safety, this I think was a little bit uh, based on a review of, they looked over six decades of serious adverse events from OMT. They're, in, they're incredibly rare. Um, Practice-based research network formed, there was basically, they were, it was reported to researchers, they did not see a lot of injury with this. 880 patients with 1800 office encounters. Um, no serious adverse events reported. So 
you know, in big corporate medicine, there's a lot of, I don't know if you should do that because I don't know what it's going to do. And the reality is, is it's fine to do it if you want to do it. I think osteopathy is something since, you know, you learned it in school for the burnout thing that's going in medicine that you can get some of that back to like, let me like relight some fire and do something else to try and bolster my, you know, my job satisfaction by getting changes off of things. I get some, I get referrals from people like stumped neurologists, stumped rheumatologists, all these other, all, it's just like, well, let's just see if we can optimize your body to do better with this condition. Headache's a classic one, but it applies to lots of different things. So um, again, a very safe thing to play around with and try. Uh, when to refer patient benefits from treatment, but the somatic dysfunction returns. You can get them to change short term, but in the end, it's like, well, it's still coming back. I'm missing something. Most places bigger cities, there's usually at least one of us. They're somewhere or nearby. There are metropolitan areas that have no DOs that are practicing full-time on them, but you can often find someone. You've got a great OMM here, department here. You can always refer there. Um, treatment's not successful. You know it's in there, but you can't get it. You physically don't have time in your practice, but you recognize that this may be something. Again, I get a lot of headache referrals from a neurologist in Oregon because he's like, well, go see him. I can't tell you what he does, but just go see him and see what he can do with it. On average, you're either going to help it, you're not going to do anything to it. But since there's no serious adverse events, you might as well try and you can learn. It doesn't take a lot of stuff. You don't have to do a 45 minute treatment on people. You can get some things. Still never spent more than a few minutes with everybody because he was able to identify catches in the system effectively. So a um, little quick documentation review. There are 10 ICD codes, ICD-10 codes, M99.0 through M99.09. That's all the codes you need for OMM. Uh, when ICD-10 came, everybody was kind of freaking out. I'm like, oh good, I still have 10 codes to deal with. You tend to primary diagnosis like uh, spondylosis of the cervical spine, rotator cuff injury. You can put pain in the fill in the blank region as the primary diagnosis and list. You have to add the 25 modifier to e &M code to show that you did the procedure on the same day as the office visit. Um, and again, the CPT codes for actually performing the manipulation are based on the number of areas that you treat, uh, 9925 through 29. Every two regions goes up a level. Um, your arms collectively is one, your legs collectively are one. So you can spend a lot of time on carpal tunnel and treat two arms and just get one region, but that's a separate billing conversation. This is some numbers that I pulled off of Medicare's website recently. I don't remember specifically with region. I was trying to get nationally this is what you get paid for doing OMT out of Medicare for regions based on things, facility and non-facility uh, fees. You can augment, not that we're doing this all for clinic revenue and clinic productivity, but patients like it when you do this to them. They don't know they like it because nobody's doing it anymore, but they don't even know to ask for it, that you can add some. I have had primary care doctors carve off an afternoon. Friday afternoon is a wonderful one that your staff can go do stuff and clean up paperwork and you're over there working. You can also incorporate it into your day-to-day -day flow. I've had uh, primary care doctors tell me, oh, you need OMT. Let me try two or three things right now. Schedule with the people up front to come back on a Friday and I'll spend a half an hour just doing that. And they take a small crop of people and they work on those or they refer them out. Um, if you treat 10 patients a week with a month off of a year, one to two regions. Your right anominate is anteriorly rotated. I'm going to muscle energy that back to middle. That one technique, ten, first and last patient of the day, 48 weeks a year, you'll pull in an extra 50, almost $15,000 into clinic revenue. And you can see some of those ones as you go up in through like that. You can justify it. You know, you can make the argument. I don't, I mean, I don't have a problem with it because I have my board certification. I've never had a problem with uh, with them saying, well, you're not supposed to be doing this or this or that. It's part of your DO credentialing that you can do it even if you're not board certified like I am. So pain's a really complicated multidimensional process. It's the person with the pain, not the pain with the person. And we have to offer alternatives to pain management other than narcotics and medication. Narcotics work, gabapentin works, doesn't fix everything. You can get that thing working better by optimizing that structure so it will function better. And we just keep working on research and everything to support OMT and a variety of use conditions. Questions? Just out of curiosity, by a show of hands, how many people do manipulation on a semi-regular basis in this room? Cool. Keep doing it. 
Um, there's lots of courses around that you can take. Convocation every third year is in Colorado Springs. There's lots of courses. The AAO has got a lunch. Uh, the Cranial Academy also has a good list of courses throughout the throughout the, the world that you can come and find and whatever else like that. So I appreciate you guys having me. And I think I will turn it over to who Dr. Buck. <laughs>